welcome. It's the 15th day of February 2014. My name is Doug Owen, and this is Blacklisted Radio. It's the day after Valentine's Day, so there will probably be limited hangout in the chat room for all of you guys and gals that engorged in love last night. Might not make it to the show for you out there that uh, have. Thank you for doing so. I had a pretty calm night. We did Valentine's Day on Tuesday. And actually, it was pretty odd. I thought that there wouldn't be that many people out on Tuesday, but it seems that there's enough people in the local area that thought the same thing that I did, that, hey, we can escape the high prices, the uh, ridiculous lines, and the uh, all, of, all of it that goes with Valentine's Day by doing it on Tuesday. Yeah, right. Did not happen. <laughs> it was frozen over which is kind of rare here in Texas, but we've had a lot of freezing weather in Central Texas that is not too unusual, but uh, people panic and they can't drive. And if you've seen what's happening on the East Coast and in Atlanta, uh, you realize that it doesn't take much for people to freak out and uh, the, the, the fear, the fear of possibly, possibly hurting yourself or being stranded just gets people doing irrational things and when it comes to irra- irrationality, uh, there's nothing shy of a perfect example in Valentine's Day. So anyway, there was tons of people out. <laughs> it didn't matter. Snowpocalypse was happening here, and everybody was uh, enjoying themselves. And we went to a, actually a really great restaurant. Just to bore you for a moment before we start talking about Bill Gates and Planned Parenthood, Groupthink and toxoplasmosis and uh, the Saudis and uh, what's happening in the Middle East. Before we get there, we'll talk about Jack Allen's Kitchen, which is a great restaurant. And one of the things that makes it so successful and so original is that it, it that they actually source local food. It's a it's farm-to-table uh, restaurant. And there's a lot of those around the country. But if you look at investments, money... That's what people are investing in. People want good food. And uh, this guy's making hand over fist. I think he has five restaurants. And uh, People want quality food. And at least, at least the people that are somewhat in tune and somewhat uh, above the fray, not quite, uh, not, <laughs> just not quite the, the, the sheeple masses that you have. And I don't like calling people sheeple, but... Uh, we're going to talk about some of these uh, odd statistics or different demographics that are pretty out to lunch today, but they, they may sound like that. I, I'm, I'm not not exactly sure, but um, with that being said, hope, hopefully uh, you had a great Valentine's Day, and uh, I, I didn't have a bad one. We ate steaks and hung out at the house, didn't do much, went to bed early so that I could do this show and be with all of you. All right. Of course, follow us on Twitter at BLN Radio, and the website with everything that you need is blacklistedradio.com. So let's talk about Cecil Richard. Uh, Cecil Richards. Uh, Planned Parenthood's Cecil Richards says, quote, women need abortions for Valentine's Day. So I would say the majority of you out there listening to this podcast probably did not go out and get an abortion for Valentine's Day. And it really speaks to the crazy fanatical people that you will find surrounding the abortion, the pro-abortion proponent movement. And, and uh, yeah, I, I know that there's always going to be extremists in any movement. You know, when you go to any kind of political rally, there's always some guy there with a Molotov cocktail. And he's probably working for the feds. And he's there, and he doesn't represent you. You know, I, I find myself... Uh, distancing my political viewpoints from those of our president. I have probably a, a lot more in common with common people around the world than I do with my government, and I would say the majority of you do as well. And so when you look at these institutions like Planned Parenthood, whether you believe it's a great thing, and I hope you don't, but if you do, uh, we'll, we'll listen to some of the people that are in your camp. Last week, we talked about religious zealots. Actually, last week, we missed the Saturday morning podcast. I did two interviews, and we, we were just inundated with guests and things happening 
it, you know how it goes. I mean, life catches you sometimes on a Saturday morning. And so uh, we try to keep the content coming and uh, as quickly as possible and doing more and more shows and putting more effort into all of them. But uh, sometimes you need a Saturday morning off. Anyway, and it wasn't like it was, it was basically kids parties. So it wasn't that uh, I was missing anything here I, I i rather have been doing the show uh, believe you me but um it, I, I talked about zealots and some of the radical people that you find in christianity with the in basically most of the let's be honest abrahamic religions <laughs> whether it's uh uh the christians muslims the uh judeo-christian uh, crazies, wackos, uh, Judaism followers. You get some zealots in there that don't necessarily speak for the whole bunch. This may be what Cecil Richards is, just some crazy, but uh, get a load of this. It comes from Bray Bart. For most women, Valentine's Day invokes feelings of romance and expressions of love. However, for Planned Parenthood, President Cecil Richards, okay, he's not just the, he's not just some wacko there i mean he is one of the wackos but he is the president says man can skip the chocolates the back rubs and the flowers because what women really need most is for this valentine's day is a safe abortion <laughs> yeah there's no uh there's no punchline in a global internet search of the varied customers of valentine's day expressions of love there were zero mentions of other abortion traditions, it appears that Ms. Richards can safely claim that she is the seminal inspiration for the Advent Guard concept. Having an abortion is value to be shared on Valentine's Day. Wow. Talk about bad messaging, bad PR, bad, bad people, crazy people that, I mean, just the fact that in this politically correct world or society that we find ourselves in here in the United States of America and the West primarily, uh, you got to find some pretty sick puppies to just throw things out here like this that, uh, you know, seem number one, obviously doesn't have a lot of good counsel. doesn't have a lot of good people, uh, advising her on what she should say. Obviously not very well coached. Um, which which may mean that uh, she probably has a legitimate love for this, this lust, safe abortions, what, you know, Valentine's Day. And, and you read the piece on it, and I, I, she tries to you know, softball it by saying, well, you know, this is the thing after Valentine's Day. Guess what happens? People make love. Well, you know, sometimes some bad decisions happen last night. We all know that bad things could have happened. Not that it's horrible, but, you know, I mean, what you, what, what, what we do when we allow other parts of our body besides our brain uh, think for us, what what may happen is a result that you don't like. You don't like that result. Well, you, know, you, can, you can find some kind of salvation in the Planned Parenthood, the, the safe abortion pushers. Anyway, it, and I don't want to turn the show, and I won't turn it into an abortion debate because, honestly, it's a monologue, in my opinion, is that the government really doesn't have a lot to do with you before they've marked you with an identifying number, before they've given you the beast code. <laughs> you haven't gone through your uh, UN indoctrination by being given an SSN, a social security number. I don't think that they really have a lot to say. They can't protect you. And I, I think that, I mean, they, they do a piss poor job currently. So we could debate about what the government should do. And what it is doing and, uh, you know, the people that are in it, the lawmakers where, you know, some people would think that you need less laws. Some of you may believe that we need more. But uh, regardless of whether you're a proponent or it horrifies you, this lady horrifies me. Okay. And if you uh, give money to Planned Parenthood, if you're one of the uh, big backers, if you're a friend of Planned Parenthood, you should call for this lady's resignation because she is, I've said it before, out to lunch. She, I, I don't know. I don't know what people think. But you just get to this mentality. Well, you will do anything to, you know, you 
become a believer. You, it becomes your religion. And I think that that's may, maybe what has happened here, where you think, oh, this is fine. I'll just say this. And, you know, Valentine's Day, <laughs> you know, anything you can do to give somebody abortion. I mean, they just become they become zealots. Anyway, um, a, a great way to lead in the show. I, I'm sorry about that. I, I tried to figure out how I could kind of couch that article and that topic in with what we want to talk about. But what I think of when I think of Planned Parenthood is Bill Gates. Bill Gates is one of those big pushers of Planned Parenthood, and he's the archetype example of what capitalism can do, and that is make you kind of a demigod and make your words important to other people because you've made a lot of money and you've screwed over a lot of your investors and well, we could go on and on and on and on and on. But, you know, for some reason, if you have a lot of money, people give you the, 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 the microphone. You get the microphone. You take the microphone and you put it up to your mouth and people listen and they care about it because, uh, I mean, you, you are important in the sense that you are providing jobs and your decisions steer the economy and you're influential. You give lots of money to groups like Planned Parenthood. So you get the microphone. It's kind of, uh, you know, but, but at the same time, he is able to do that because of his somewhat uh, underhanded tactics in business and being shrewd, not being necessarily the smartest guy in the room and uh, obviously pretty well connected. His, his uh, mother and father were some of the people that were, uh, at, at the beginning, uh, um, working with Margaret Sanger in Planned Parenthood. So something that's near and dear to his heart, and uh, we can definitely point to many of his his uh, comments and quotes that prove that he's kind of a eugenicist and uh, he's a big, big fan of abortions. So here you go. Um, he says that, and this is the big push here, is education. And I want to talk about education today primarily for at least 15 minutes or so, because it's very important because we have things like Common Core, which are these national uh, standardized new lessons, new learning methods, new speak for kids to get them educated. And people are freaking out. And if you've seen some of the examples of things like basically whitewashing the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, I mean, you can at least get the first five, right? <laughs> uh, just changing it. You know, what does the Second Amendment mean? You can have guns. A militia can have guns. Not quite. And you got to think about the te- the context of that. You can't oversimplify that. But what do you tell a four-year-old? Admittedly, now he shouldn't be in, or she shouldn't be in your regular, you know, public education system by that age, but. You know, there's some things that I can say, well, you know, you kind of simplify them for children because you don't want to immediately explain the horrors of the world to children. But, you know, if you set this precedence of lying to your children from a very early age, it's very hard to change yourself and your impression or impression of the world to those children back to, well, you know, that was all a bunch of bull crap kids. <laughs> we taught you about the Easter bunny and the tooth fairy and such, you know, the, the, all the mythos of your childhood. And now we're telling you the reality and uh, it's cold and brutal and uh, welcome to the callous world we know today. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you can really do that that well, but anyway, I, I find that the, the education system primarily that has built a working class and we know about Nelson Rockefeller and all of the other philanthropists and those that uh, brought about uh, the U.S. education system as a way to get people out of the arts, out of law, out of (laughs) doing uh, free thinking. Not that that people really at the beginning of the 20th century had a lot of time to think about stuff, but but people were because of the Industrial Revolution they were having more time, and God knows that if you want an industrial, military-driven economy, you don't need a lot of people reading <laughs> philosophy books. You, you need people that can can make military weaponry. You need people that can farm, and that's really what the U.S. education system came out of was the need to uh, farm and 
and, and build the industrial base, and it geared us, and it has geared generations, uh, my generation and generations right behind me for a huge gap, the huge divide, the economic gap. We have people that are being trained to push buttons that no longer are relative because of technology or relevant rather, uh, the relatively screwed is what they are. So when it comes to the education system, uh, you have this new, new idea and it's common core. Okay. Now I'm not a proponent. I, I don't know enough about it, but what I've read is that it reminds me very much of what you have today. So what I'm saying is that I'm not for common core. I don't know enough about common core and I see that, uh, states, like Oklahoma, Texas, and others have pushed off and are fighting Common Core, and that there is a huge rising uh, amount of opposition. Bill Gates says all of you that don't like Common Core are caught up in the myths, shrouded in myths. This comes from uh, Breitbart, an op-ed in USA Today, which you know Jane Hartman's Israeli spy, the Israeli spy, her husband bought USA Today for a dollar. Look that up. It's true. So, when you, and this is the rag that they shove in front of your hotel room door. You're stuck reading USA Today because it's free. Well, you may have read this from Bill Gates. Bill Gates writes that Common Core state standards are to be, quote, commended because they will improve education for millions of students. Yay. And that arguments against the standards are shrouded in myths. After the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has spent well over $170 million to create and implement the Common Core Standards. Now, if you spent $170 million to implement Common Core Standards, you would be a proponent. Now, Bill Gates has basically created the new education system, as Nelson Rockefeller and, uh, well, you know, so many others along the way. I mean, we could get into all of them. From Kinsey <laughs> to uh, you know Alexander Pope, others, but but the point is, is now for the new generation of kids, you're going to be basically getting Windows operating systems for children's heads. Eh, I mean, it might work. You know, I, I'm using it right now, so can't say enough about it. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation spent this money, their their foundation, $170 million. They've allying themselves with the political elites. Gates is defending his pet project that is now mired in controversy. Ironically, Gates claims that Common Core is among, quote, among the most important education ideas in years, end quote, is minimized by the next statement. The standards are just that standard, similar to those that have glued teach or guided teachers in all states for years. So it's a standard, certain things you got to know. You got to know who created Windows. <laughs> you got to know that the Second Amendment means that you get militias get guns or whatever else it is that, uh, you know, people need to believe. And if you look at some of the standards in the math, these uh, different math, what are they called? Ah, they're math uh, groups. Uh, they're, they're, anyway, they, they have all these, these uh, number families. It's kind of a different system. It's not nearly as uh, involved as multiplication and division. And I remember going through all that in fifth grade and this is fourth grade and then moving to fifth grade. We're getting into division and doing all these things. And how do you divide? It's very important how to divide. You learn that with pies. How many pieces do you get? So um, Gates goes on to say here uh, that the main point is, quote, except these standards are inspired by a simple and powerful idea, every American student should leave high school with the knowledge and skills to succeed in college and in the job market. Today, 80% of students say they expect to go to college, while only 40% of adults have an associate degree or higher. Clearly, the old standards didn't help them achieve their goals. Common Core was created to fix that. And this is the honest truth. Okay, right now what we have today is a failure. When I got out of high school, I had to take remedial, non-credited courses to learn English again, to l remember all of those things that you learned. 
But I can't blame that on the high school. I could really blame most of that on my dislike for the system, the amount of hours I was spending there per day. It took me away from what I wanted to do, which was pretty much free thinking and free loving. And all the other things that high school kids just don't give a crap about that you can find on a, on a high school campus. The only thing that you can incentivize them with is the idea that they're going to get a job and that they need this education. And you probably do. You probably do need some kind of education to get a job for Bill Gates. But it's not that people aren't smart enough and can't take remedial classes to learn what they haven't learned from high school. I mean, high school, let's be honest, it's the bare effing minimum. Bare effing minimum. It's not, it's not the, the, it's not a private school. I mean, you, you're paying for it and you get taxed for it, but it's, it's only the bare standard that you need to survive. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, for us in this, this world that we live in today, that is so divided for so many different reasons from being able to really educate our own children. And there's some people that are just not geared to educate their own children. They don't, they don't have the ability nor, nor the talent or skill that is required uh, to do that. I probably could not be a great educator, especially if I was given standards. But anyway, it goes on to, you know, point out the fact that what we have today is pretty crappy. And I agree. <laughs> it is crappy. And so when it comes to the education system, the revamping and, you know, really, I mean, $170 million sounds like a lot of money that Bill Gates put into it. But I mean, he puts things into stuff that flops all the time. Uh, pointedly, he had a company, I had this in my batch of stuff to look at, that uh, just recently failed here in Texas. I mean, he, had, he just uh, filed for bankruptcy. I've got it here. Let me just look Gates. No, come on, Windows. Come on, Windows. You don't want to find it? Uh, yeah, he had an energy company. You know, he's got all these pet projects anyway. He wants to, uh, one of his big things is create a new toilet, the new toilet. And that might be something that's groundbreaking because we're still using technology from the, you know, 1800s to, 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 uh, get rid of crap. And really, that's kind of the bane of what, uh, we have to do to keep, keep our society going is figuring out what to do with all the shit. Uh, so maybe that could be that could revolutionize things, but uh, you know I think that Windows is shit too. Um, yeah, he had a Texas energy company, and this is just one of many of his epic failures. I mean, we you know, we, and this is this. There's two things to take away from this. Success is not nobody remembers your failures. Okay, this story is going to come and go. Uh, Bill Gates Energy Company has filed for bankruptcy protection as the depressed power market results in untenable financial losses. How can you, I mean, we're on the precipice of having rolling blackouts, how you can't find, and Texas is expanding greatly. How you can not, and, and the power is getting more expensive by the day. How you can't make Profit in Texas with an oil or energy company baffles me. <laughs> it's like, wow. It's like, how can you not make glass when you have sand? It should be. I mean, that's your business. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's the bad economy. Well, so that, that shows that two things. One, that you know the most successful people have failures all the time. And two, that you're gauged by your successes. And most of the time, if they are big enough, they will outweigh your failures. Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, had a bunch of businesses, I don't, uh, two, three, or four that that came up with nothing. So people that are consummate entrepreneurs, people, and that's what I will give Bill Gates credit for, somebody that uh, just picks up and keeps on moving. Uh, not that he hasn't had help and he hasn't... Uh, definitely been uh positioned to be as successful as he is uh he george soros other billionaire philanthropist types uh, fail at all sorts of things all of the time planned parenthood i wish they would fail but there's still so many people that will think well you know miss richards just had it uh she just was a little too emphatic about her business model anyway uh 
Case in point for Bill Gates here. One in four Americans thinks the sun goes around the earth. Can this be true? Is this real? <laughs> NPR reports a quarter of Americans surveyed could not correctly answer that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, according to a report out Friday from... Uh, I'm just going to cut off. Let me just go to the original here. On a report from, let's see, American Association in Adventure, or excuse me, Adventure, Advancement of Science meeting in Chicago. And and the National Science Foundation worked on this as well. Quote, does the earth go around the sun? This is the question. Or does the sun go around the earth? 26% of those surveyed answered incorrectly. Incorrectly. Now, you can't blame this all in the high school. So you should have kind of learned this. I mean, Galileo, what I mean, he was, uh, you know, run out of town and uh, was castigated. He was ostracized for daring to give you this information. Now, it should be pretty evident that the Earth revolves around the sun because we have telescopes today. Okay, we don't just have the high priest and our our, our tribe to tell us fairy tales, although we still have some of that in the mainstream media, actually a lot of that, but uh, nonetheless, things like this should be somewhat evident. You know, you don't have to, you should be able to find, I don't know, 85% of the people that can figure out the sky is usually blue, should be blue, ideally. Uh, so anyway, um, what do you do with this? What do you take away from a story like this what's the big lesson the the fact is that the u.s education system um i don't know this is something you should have learned and if people aren't uh it's probably a varied reason and maybe people are just that that ridiculously stupid or maybe drunk or maybe half deaf uh, the EU, though, I mean, before all of you Europeans listening get get up on your high horse here, in the same survey, uh, just 39% answered correctly true that the universe began with a huge explosion and only 48% said human beings as we know them today developed from earlier species of animals. Now, see, this is where NPR loses me, and I start thinking there may be a little bit of a political agenda. Evolutionism? I mean, there was the big debate with Bill Nye, the science guy, and some other guy that's a proponent of creationism. And, and here's the thing. I mean, the big, bang, the big Bang theory and physics, those are theories, just like electrical theory. Now, you could say that, that happened. I think that this is the problem. Okay, I don't necessarily agree with the Big Bang because I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, now we're starting to hear that, well, black holes may not exist. Dinosaurs that I grew up with when I was in the 80s, you know, they, they, they don't exist. What was it? Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus, there's a few of them. They're like, well, we put them together wrong. Didn't work out. <laughs> Found some of these dinosaurs. Some of you probably are like, whoa, what? What? It's not true. Yeah, no, it wasn't true. But, you know, I don't think there was a grand the dinosaur conspiracy. Teach you that there was... The wrong dinosaurs, I just think that science is evolving, and this is the best guess. And often we're right, but sometimes we're wrong, and so you can't just hang your hat on science as being absolute. You can't do it. People try all the time. Don't be that guy. So the Big Bang, oh, you don't know what happened? I think that you should know that the Big Bang is a theory as to how we created the universe or how, how, we, how the universe was created. But there's other alternative theories that are just as valid that, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to get into quantum physics because I think at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's theoretical. So much of that stuff, it's very interesting, but it's very theoretical and enough of it's politicized to make it, um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, I don't understand why people are so hell bent on convincing others that their theory is right kind of goes back to religion we started the show with that and uh abortion unfortunately valentine's day but it goes back to these are kind of belief systems and people get very evolved involved in them and, and very vested in these ideas you see it all the time 
You know, whether Common Core is good or bad, Bill Gates is going to be pushing for it because he spent $140 million. Okay, he's trying to sell it because he doesn't want to have one of the biggest educational flops. He wants to be remembered as a philanthropist. He wants to be a Vanderbilt. He wants to be a Rockefeller. He wants to be a Carnegie. He wants to be a Ford. He wants to be a Cecil Rhodes or have a foundation. He's got foundations. He'll probably have lots of groups and think tanks and other creepy people with Henry Kissinger and George Soros and John McCain in the background. I'm sure he already probably does. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, and it, and it might just be the TV. <laughs> There's another one out of the Daily Mail here. Children who watch three hours of TV a day could be left educationally stunted and prone to bullying. Now this is, I don't know if this is anti-TV, if they're trying to get people to the Internet or what's going on here, but, uh, you know, mainstream media reporting that TV is making your children stupid. You know, you can you can try to talk to them all day long, but if they're geared and groomed to the TV and they listen to the TV, maybe that's not only having a stunting effect, but, you know, allowing you to become passive and submissive. And that's in, that's the other oddball takeaway from this story and this research is that somehow when you watch TV, you let people push you around. Sounds like a great, great agenda for those in government that want a passive and docile population. Is that taking place? They're like, oh, well, we found that your kids are dumb as crap and they let other people push them around if they watch a lot of TV. The Daily Mail reports toddlers who watch three hours of TV a day may end up educationally stunted, physically weak, physically weak, and prone to bullying. Studies revealed researchers found that after two hours of viewing, every extra hour of TV has the potential to harm a child's development both physically and socially. This includes poor vocabulary, math skills, attention in class, Victimization by classmates in poor physical prowess at nursery. The study also looked at 1,997 boys and girls aged 29 months whose parents reported their television viewing behavior as part of the Quebec longitudinal, 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 hmm, that's weird, uh, study of child development. It's just kind of spelled odd, but this is how they do it in Europe. In the Europe, in the Eurozone. Like, uh, like changing out the Z's with S's, making it very confusing. And uh, nonetheless, the, uh, the, the reality is for most of you that have been listening to this show or just got the inside track a long time ago that saw the obvious, that read 1984, maybe Atlas Huxley's Brave New World, that the telescreen will control your life and it can really, you know, change people. And, you know, I think about the kids that I know that are in my my sphere of influence, if you will, my, my family and friends and their kids. And, you know, they watch TV, but I don't think most of them watch more than three hours of TV a day. And they do other things. But what are they doing and how much of that is surrounded by video games and other stuff? And it... You know, I, actually, I think most of them, most of them, other than a few apartment dweller friends of mine, pretty much, uh, you know, let their kids have at least two hours of unrestricted play per day outside. And that's really important. That's that's the metric. That's the mile marker that you want to hit. And that's for most children to develop. They have to have that unrestricted play for at least two hours and, you know, some tender cut kind uh, love and I'm not saying that you shouldn't let them watch documentary films and other you know things on television, but uh, good moderation and healthy lifestyle habits. And, and it speaks really to just bad parenting, the latchkey kids, the kids that are forgotten, the kids that are, you know, taught to. And, and I see it with children all the time. You know, the television becomes the babysitter. It's the one thing that gives the parents some relief. They're like, oh, good. <laughs> Just stare at that for a while so I can get a break, you know, so I can grab a quick smoke. Ugh. So, I mean, most of us are have been there or are or, or there with uh, children trying to, you know, be the most important thing in their life. You know, you, you have to be more important than Bill Gates. 
you have to be more important than their message and you have to fill the gap. You know, and I think there should be a gap. I don't want a full immersion school system where they teach every aspect of morality and what people should should be doing to my children or, you know, every truth. They, they should be skeptical of the, of the system. The system should not be perfect. The system should allow for parents to fill in those voids. I mean, you know, in a free society, you have to let people be free to have opinions that are not necessarily in your mind based on science. I have this all the time. I think that, you know, I've proven a point pretty well, pretty eloquently, and, you know, come to find out that somebody still disagrees with me. It just drives me nuts. I'm like, how can you not be compelled by the same thing that I'm looking at? And then you realize, well, you know, at some point when somebody's informed, the same point that you are, then you make that informed opinion, that informed position on a topic, whatever it may be. And you have to let people do that because you've done it as well. All right. So um, group think. I wanted to talk about this to wrap it all up. And that's what you're going to get the most out of. And that's what Bill Gates and Common Core and uh, the current system that we have today currently really promotes. And that is group think, you know, getting the answer right. There's the, the authority that says this is the answer, and regardless of whether it's true or not, you should bow down and conform to, to it. And we've seen some of the bad teachers. You know, Don't question me. Don't question it. It doesn't matter if what I'm saying is incorrect. You need to continue to put down the answer I tell you to. And I think those are just some extreme examples of bad teachers, but um, you know, maybe that's a prevailing thought. You need groupthink. So Motherboard has this really interesting piece, and I think it kind of wraps this all up. In 1961, psycho- psychologist Stanley Milgram began an experiment that left humanity with one of the most dismal and damning self-portraits we're ever, we're ever seen. Uh, and it seemed the, uh, it seemed to demonstrate that the overwhelming majority of regular Americans are willing to administer a lethal electric shock to a human victim when promoted to do so by an authority figure. Basically, somebody says, look, you know, I'm your teacher. You need to shock Billy. (gasps) What do you mean? You you need to push the button. So uh, Milgrove did a lot of really interesting uh, research, and uh, you you should look him up. He's got a wiki page. Uh, Psychologist Stanley Milgram. Anyway, a decade later, Milgram's fellow psychologist and former high school classmate, Philip Zim. Bardo performed another experiment at Stanford University, which is more well known, that captured on tape the transformation of regular college students into authoritarian monsters in a matter of days. Those playing the role of guards had the prisoners going mad in solitary confinement and defecating in buckets in their cells. Zimbardo shut the experiment down halfway through, but only after his fellow psychologist and future wife Appeal to his sense of humanity. Okay, look, this is insane. These people are letting, making him, yeah, you know, obviously doing this. This is really bad. And it, there's a great documentary on the Stanford uh, experiment. Anyway, the experiments were part of a greater intellectual reaction to the 1962 trial of Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi bureaucrat generally regarded as the man who signed off on the Holocaust. An explanation was sought. But as far as outward appearances, Eichmann was no blood-hungry ogre. He was an average-looking, middle-aged pencil pusher with thinning hair. In her classic account of Eichmann's trial, quote, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah uh, Ardent summed up the Nazi, uh, oh, I can't read that, maybe, Obsterbahnführers, the Obsterbahnführers, life and thus quote except for the extraordinary diligence in looking out for his personal advancement he had no motives of all uh motives of it all and he was just following orders so you know you you look at this and people were just appalled i mean what a cold callous guy just signing off and saying look this is these people aren't valuable anymore it's time to to get rid of the the extra people People see this account, regardless of what you know may have occurred and all of the, the obfuscation around the Holocaust and what the Nazis were doing, 
the idea to sign off to to allow this to happen. Some people debate whether it was towards the end of the war, only after the uh, the imminence of the failure of Germany did they start conducting these these brutal and gruesome atrocities. You get into the debate about how many people and. You know, if it was a thousand, it's too many. And if it's, you know, 10,000, it doesn't have to be six million. And it doesn't have to just be the Jewish people. And there was plenty of other nor do wells. And it's not that it was that, uh, you know, out of the norm for the time. I mean, you look at the U.S., we rounded up the Japanese, World War II. We had concentration camps. We didn't put the gas to them. As far as we know, or not as many of them, and uh, you know, but but not far behind. So, you know, when people talk about the era and how the the how horrendous and heinous the what the the Germans were for what they did, you you look right across the pond. You know, we were funding them, and uh, at the same time, at least a lot of people were Ig Farben and uh, you know the the. Uh, the Prescott Bushes of the day and uh, and the like uh, that uh, were profiting from the war. And there's always people that profit from both sides of the war. And the war machine money is always there. So, um, but but my point being is that that, that was kind, and it was nothing that Stalin, Lenin, and uh, the, the Russians and uh, other European nations were not doing or others that, uh, you know, genocide... At the time, was not that big of a deal. Look to Armenia. Look to North Korea. The U.S. turned a blind eye to forty thousand dissidents, leftists, and socialists being killed in North, uh, not North Korea, in, in Korea, South Korea, uh, during that war, during that conflict that was not a war. So my point being is that it was just kind of vogue for the time, rounding up and killing people. You know, going even to the 1970s looking at what his Henry Kissinger supported in Chile uh the the uh, the even in the 80s uh Iran Contra the Nicaraguan freedom fighters you know supporting these different groups and you know bringing you right here to what's happening in Syria today I mean if you're putting people and gassing them or if you're just giving weapons to those countries and giving madmen tons of power Bad stuff happens. Genocide happens. That should be a t-shirt. Genocide happens. Anyway, my point was, and I'll wrap up the group think, is that people do horrific things as long as they think that there's an authority figure. I find people that believe that they're Christians all the time that support war and support the military, what they're doing, and they think that they're Christians, and it's just, oh, okay, uh, yeah. I mean, Jesus was a radical. Jesus Fought the tax man. Jesus didn't uh, uh, kill people on the authority. He never said that it's okay if the state says you should kill people to kill people and that you will be forgiven for those sins. So these people, I mean, it's not that it's 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 not that they are confused. It's that they have no idea what it is that they believe. They're beyond confused. It's not confusion. It's not. It's not the inability to see the lack of morality in their argument. It's that they are not <laughs> they are not Christians by any sense. They are just people that s- prescribe to cult statist ideologies. Okay, if it's not the religious groups, it's the state telling you that it's okay to kill. If you think that, if you can look at something that is so simple like the Ten Commandments, and you can't see that what you're doing and what the state is doing is in direct defiance. You, know, you probably think the earth still, ro- ro- you know, the sun rotates around the earth. <laughs> you probably are one of those people that cannot answer that question. All right. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of stuff I have here. Uh, but I guess we should should go to... Uh, mind controlling the mind controlling cat par- parasite that has found in has been found in the Arctic beluga whales, toxoplasmosis. Now this is a huge issue, and I think that it's a, a fine example of how there are really really cr- 
crazy things that are happening in the uh, the viral parasite community, if you will, uh, that are happening uh, in the world that I think are pretty damn scary, <laughs> including superbugs and uh, the inability for antibiotics to really be effective going forward in the next just few decades. Those things really scare the crap out of me, but... When it comes to swine flu, everybody's freaked out about that. It's always about the flu, but very rarely do we talk about toxoplasmosis. And it's something that I know that the Internet probably cannot embrace since the Internet is nothing but. Not, let me say it's not nothing but. That's that's an over-exaggeration. It is filled and has a huge, oddly, disproportionately large amount of pictures of kitty cats on the internet that has really fueled the drive for engine traffic and made YouTube popular. People looking at other videos of people's kittens and the ability to take video and put it on there cheaply and share with millions of other people around the world, billions potentially, uh, that, that barriers broke down. Why? Why we're so, I don't know, I think felines have a certain power over humanity. They really do. <laughs> and when you meet a cat, they're very rarely impressed with you. And they, you always get the sense that they think that they're smarter than you. Anyway, they are the carriers primarily of tax, uh, Toxoplasma Gandhi. If you haven't heard of Toxoplasmosis, something you can get from cats when you're pregnant or when your wife is pregnant, they warn her to stay away from cats and cat crap because it is transmitted in the feces. And it's... It's pretty crazy, this story. Uh, the mind-controlling cat parasite, Toxoplasma gondii, is, uh, is now also a beluga whale parasite after researchers in Canada have found it in the hearts and diaphragms of the Arctic Sea. Dwellers finding Toxoplasma in whales is bad news on all sorts of fronts. First, it's an example of a disease that was once found only in temperate environments making its way to the Arctic. Yeah, you know, from Brazil, where you see a lot of it, like 80% of the population has it, to the Arctic. Second, it's an example of disease jumping from terrestrial mammal to an ocean-dwelling one, which is huge. And finally, it represents a major health concern for the Inuit people who rely on beluga for meat. So they are going to be the ones that ultimately pay the price, I think, at the, the end of the day, uh, as well as the uh, whole uh, ecology. Now, this isn't something that um, they have a solution for. You get this parasite. I, I think it's treatable, but it's so under the radar that you know, there's a lot of people, millions of people that have it and have no idea. And it actually does control your mind. It does make you more aggressive. It does make you violent. It does make you irrational. And you would think that something that can control your mind i mean it has the zombification aspect to it and the zombie the zombie movement in this country is huge and people love zombies maybe they've had their 14 minutes of fame but you can still find ammunition called zombie killers and uh, like hornaday i think they they make uh, some of the zombie killing rounds and people you know i mean it's 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 fun you know the idea of the dead coming back to life and uh, the Walking Dead is a series that is now at epic popularity. People love The Walking Dead. I, I hear about it all the time. Hey, man, have you seen it? Have you seen it? People really have this passion and love for zombies. And you would think that with all that, that this would make it, uh, it make its way to the headlines. And maybe it will in the very near future, but it's something that um, you just... Be aware. Don't let your kids play with poop crap. And if they're out there in a sandbox, make sure you cover it up because you don't want cat turds in your sandbox. They they love to do that. And if you have little little ones, I would suggest maybe finding somebody to take care of your kitty cat for a while or, or getting the cat tested. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it, it's... It's pretty crazy, though, when you really think about it and the fact that it's transferred to so many different uh, species in, in multiple climates and it's moving into uh, the, the foodstuffs and, and we might have more and more of it in uh, 
you know, cattle. We, we haven't seen it in cattle production yet, but that will be used as another reason to get everybody drinking the Soylent Green. Uh, you know, the, you, there's this definite push to get people off of meat, uh, to get people away from, from animal fat, which is really, really good for you. And uh, you may be able to replace the nutritional uh, value of animal fat, but... Um, it's not, it's not easy by any stretch. Uh, animal fat is something that human beings, uh, are almost geared to need for brain function and, and the like. It is something that uh, we depend on, uh, very, very much so. And you can replace it. There's other proteins, you know, I mean, from beans to, uh, you know, the like, I, I don't work. I, I'm not an aficionado on how to get other protein sources because I'm a fan of animal fat. Well, if that makes its way there into your animal fat, then you know we're parasites. They're cumulative. The more parasites you have in your brain, the worst. The worst. Uh, money managers, the business folks, the economy are on crack. Jack Lou met with some of the bankster gangsters. Economic Policy Journal had a really interesting piece, and uh, this is kind of happening behind the scenes. The debt ceiling is going to be increased. I think it's notable that that Canada has completely, next year, 2015, they have eliminated the debt. They have a budget surplus. I, I That just blows me away. And we can say, why, 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 why do we have so much debt? And it's because... It's two part. It's because we pay interest, a phenomenal amount of interest on the debt. The usury is inexcusable. But at the same time, you know, the, I get credit cards in my mailbox all the time telling me, hey, Doug, zero interest balance transfer for six months. Then it goes up to 27%. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> all the fine print. Don't read this down here. Blah, blah, blah. You can uh, you could blame me if I get into debt. Uh, I think honestly because uh, the offers are there and the ability for myself to, you know, live a pretty fiscally conservative life uh, are are you know are, is what what I do with with my decisions. I decide to not debt myself for insane amounts of of cash that I use for pet projects. So the amount, the amount of corruption and the uh, amount of pet projects and subsidizing of everything to control the economy is really where you see most of that money going and the big discrepancies and the, the need for more and more cash to be printed. I mean, every time the government says, well, we got a plan, <laughs> you know, that money has to come up from somewhere. They cannot balance the budget constitutionally they are required to do so I, and i think that this should uh these these budget shortfalls should be almost impeachable if they need more money then they have to go to the people they have to go to the congress and uh, you know people that vote these congress critters back in time and time again can expect no change uh, and, and can actually expect it to get worse because they are engendering uh, delinquency and bad decision making. There's no repercussions financially. The only way that you're going to stop bad decisions happening and uh, the amount of money being created is to have some kind of repercussion. You know, you have to whip and spank and shame and chastise those bad bankers and those bad politicians that continue to borrow from them. And it's two part. People love. It's easy to say shame on the bankers because we all hate giant Jamie Dimon. Who doesn't? I mean, if you're the only reason that you like Jamie Dimon is because you're making a lot of money or you're hoping to uh, get some of the, the prestige off of them. Anyway, uh, so interesting roundtable of people met with the new Timothy Geidner, the new Treasury Secretary, Jack Lew, who's been there but hasn't been making headlines because Jack Lew can pay his taxes. And remember, when Timothy Geidner didn't pay taxes on $30,000 worth of uh, capital gains and financial real estate that he had. That's an oversight. When you don't pay that, that's crime. You go to jail. So uh, 
Jack Lou, good buddy of the Obamas. You can look at his his uh, history. He's uh, he's part of the revolving door scenario, and uh, you know he met with with Goldman partner uh, Levin Natfels and uh, let's see, uh, Kramer Levin, Stephen M. Goldman. Let's see who else? I've got a bunch of people here that he met with. Anyway, they had this big confab, secret meeting. None of the minutes have been released. They've had these round tables. Everybody from Lowe's, BlackRock, let's see, Post Rock Advisors, Advent Capital, Boston Provident, Morgan Stanley, Evercore, Center Bridge, Kingdon Capital, R.R. Donnelly. They all met with him in this big confab. So something big's probably about to happen. I think a lot of people are really waiting for it. Uh, 2014 is shaping up to be a very, if not the most interesting uh, year thus far in the economy. And the parallels to 1921, or excuse me, 1929 are there. So uh, more bankster gangsters, more little meetings. And this is the first big government powwow post Davos. So interesting to note the people there. These are the benefactors, the stakeholders in it. Uh, I saw this out of foreign policy. I thought it was pretty funny, and it's kind of a takeaway. Fed say Mexican tycoon exploited super PACs to influence U.S. elections. And it shows you how uh, much your vote means and how criminals are at the head of the table and they're making more decisions. Uh, and it, it, It's funny because um, this is how all super PACs are funded. <laughs> this is how all super PACs are, are run. But whenever you find somebody that you don't like and you find somebody like this Mexican tycoon here that's it, it getting involved, it becomes a, a notable news item. Not a big item. I mean, this isn't, you know, your, your five o'clock nightly news type stuff, but, uh, NPR reported on it. In a first of its case, federal prosecutors say a Mexican businessman funneled more than $500,000 into U.S. political races through super PACs. In various shell companies, the alleged financial scheme is first known is the first known instance of a foreign national exploiting the Supreme Court Citizens United decision in order to influence U.S. elections. Now, I know what you're thinking. My God, how much money comes from Israel and Europe and all over the world into the U.S. election systems? How many of these guys get front row tickets? to our government, the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, and we go on, all of the people that get that are from foreign governments that are bringing money and funneling them into super PACs. I mean, that's really what the, the APAC's all about. I mean, there are so many different lobby groups, some pale in comparison when it comes to the power factor and the financial might behind them when it, you know, in comparison to APAC, but you know, there, there's other French foreign affairs and uh, Middle East policy groups that do get uh, some table time. International Crisis Group one, and they have corporate financier backers from global corporations, many of which don't pay taxes in this country and do business around the world. So, with that, knowing that, what's the big deal with this Mexican tycoon? And so you lo you look into it and you start realizing, oh, well, people don't like this guy. They don't like the politicians that <laughs> he's supporting. Till now, allegations surrounding Jose Susamo Azano Matsura, uh, the owner of multiple construction companies in Mexico, have not spread beyond local news outlets in San Diego, where he's accused of bankrolling a handful of Southern California can candidates. But the scandal is beginning to attract national interest as it ensnares a U.S. congressman, a Washington, D.C.-based campaign firm, and the legacy of one of the most important Supreme Court decisions in a generation, long-standing federal law, foreign nationals are prohibited from donating to political campaigns at the state, local, and federal level. On January 21st, the U.S. Attorney's Office accused Ravneet Singh, uh, proprietor of the Washington campaign firm, Election Mall and Ernesto Inacias, uh, I think that's right, maybe uh, Encinas, Encinas, there you go, a 
former San Diego police detective, of using Azano's money to support three Democratic politicians and the city's Republican district attorney. Ah, so it's bipartisan. A couple Dems and a Republican need a judge and a few other people to make this thing happen. So, you know, long story short, the uh, foreign influence in these huge super PACs is appalling. And the super PACs themselves, I mean, we ran up to the, the, the latest election between Obama and Romney. It was nothing short of insane, the amount of money. Uh, unfathomable amounts of money, over a billion dollars. I think it was one point eight billion dollars. Remember Obama campaign saying that we needed, you know, a billion dollars, and people are like, "My God, man, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money you need there, buddy." I can only imagine what the next election, the big presidency, twenty sixteen, will will uh, probably pale in comparison. And there's already super PACs. You know, I'm ready for Hillary. We talked about that one and and others. I don't know if the the Republicans. I mean, they're not ready. They don't have anybody, and and why should they? Hillary is now polled to be the most popular presidential candidate, not of the 2016 election, but ever, ever. Yeah, well, you know, you look at who her allegiances are. She she says herself that she likes to go to K Street and down to the Council on Foreign Relations to get her, her marching orders. She said that on several occasions, and I, I would never call a lady a liar. I believe her wholeheartedly. All right, guys. Maybe uh, this is probably the most radical of the Valentine's Day hangover episodes we've done in the last few years. Maybe not. Anyway, thanks for being part of it. You can follow us on Twitter. BLN Radio is my personal handle. You can tweet at me. You can also get the news feed at Blacklisted News on Twitter. That's the handle for that. And BlacklistedRadio.com. Please support the show. It's independent, commercial-free and uncompromised and i'll be back next saturday morning 10 a.m central standard time for another live edition of blacklisted news radio until then take care